Bring Warm Clothes is made possible in part by Target Stores, Dayton's, and Mervyn's through the Dayton Hudson Foundation, and by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting through the Central Educational Network. Things have changed since Minnesota was young. For one, indoor plumbing. But much has remained the same. Parents still fret over an ill child. Workers still rejoice when they find decent jobs to feed their families. War still is hell. Bring Warm Clothes is a Minnesota family scrapbook. You'll be hearing true stories from some of the people who settled here people whose courage and fears, humor and hardships help shape who we Minnesotans are today. These are not the stories of governors and business leaders. Their achievements are chronicled in many other places. These are the stories of lumberjacks, soldiers, homemakers, farmers, ordinary people who left us their life stories in the form of letters, diaries and photographs. They knew how good and how brutal the good old days were. They lived them. Minnesota had a strong grip on some of her earliest visitors, the fur traders. George Nelson left his home in Montreal when he was 16 to become a clerk at the XY Fur Trading Company. He lived in what is now known as the St. Croix Valley. He kept a diary of his experiences. Many a time in walking, I have thought, whenever this country becomes settled, how delightfully will the inhabitants pass their time. There's no place, perhaps on this globe, where nature has displayed and diversified land and water as here. I always felt as if invited to settle down and admire the beautiful views with a sort of joyful thankfulness for having been led to them. We had two Indian widows to pass the winter by us in a wretched hut. They had two daughters and two boys. I surprised to remark the boys frequently with black faces. Upon inquiring, I found they were fasting. They sometimes dreamed of their departed friends, and on those occasions when they awake in the morning, they bruise soft coal in their hands, with which they rub their faces so as not to leave one spot of the natural color, take their guns or bow and arrows and go into the woods a-hunting, and to mourn and weep where they may not be seen nor heard. They return at even and eat after sunset. 
The woman would frequently go out to the foot of the hill, some distance off, and weep and mourn and moan, addressing her departed husband and friends in accents and a tone of voice not to be misunderstood even by me, young, thoughtless, and boisterous as I was. What is this? Is it barbarism? If so, what signify the Irish wakes, or our own wailings on the departure of those dear to us? After a few months, and not unfrequently only some days, and we return to the busy occupations of life, and finally become quite reconciled and oblivious, yet here, children, after several years, go into the woods and bewail their departed friends in quiet and solitude, fasting the whole day. And on their return, they would generally be cheerful, as if it had not been them who but a moment before were making such wailing, or as if they had just been pouring off all their grief. I've often witnessed such scenes, and they've left an indelible impression. Fort Snelling, built high above the Mississippi River in 1819, was for decades literally the edge of the frontier. Never the scenes of battles, it was mostly involved in encouraging and regulating trade with the Indians. In fact, it was established primarily because the U.S. wanted to prevent the Indians from trading their furs to the British. With about 300 soldiers, officers, and dependents, Fort Snelling was the center of white civilization and a strategic place to experience early Minnesota and her charms. Gustavus Otto was an army private at Fort Snelling. Oftentimes, the army was a haven for fugitives from the law. This may have been Gustavus' story. He wrote to his wife in Detroit in 1849 to ask for his release from the army. The original letter was in German. Fort Snelling, 7th of April, 1849, Iowa Territory. Dear Louise, although I intended several times to write you, circumstances, labors, and feelings did not allow me to do this. As I come today from my watch duty, I have time to do this. The winters are very cold here, particularly this one. We are in thick stone buildings and had each two men three woolen blankets and haystacks. And yet we had to make a fire in the midst of the night in order not to freeze. I myself had my face and ears frozen, but I'm cured again. I have not been sick until this winter when I caught a severe cold and had to pass several days at the hospital. I am better of it and would feel entirely well again, but the daily thought, the dreams and restlessness, which I have almost every night for my poor children. Since two months, three soldiers have already been released by their sergeant. Also today, one got free again. He is from Baltimore. You could also do it if you wanted to do it. And my request to you is to do it. I will not return to you if you do not want it, for you live perhaps happier without me, which I wish from all my heart. But I am no drunkard anymore, and I have learned to work, and if I was free, I could anyhow do something for my poor children and save in order to enjoy my old age if I should reach this. But my hands are tied, and five years of my life are gone without helping my children at all. I beg you once more from all my heart to do for me what you can. God will reward you. I am still innocent of adultery as I was before, although the temptations for it are strong enough here. Do you not wish to have me free again? Write as soon as possible as I want to go to California then to establish a new home there. And let me learn to forget my dear poor children. Be sure to have them educated properly, that they may not become so unhappy as their forsaken, unhappy father. Tell them a heartfelt farewell. Greet and kiss them from me. God grant you altogether health and happiness. 
and well wishes from your lonely Gustavus Otto, Company East 6th Infantry Regiment. Otto did not stay long in Minnesota. By the next summer, he had deserted the army and fled to California. Some journeyman preacher would make a profitable trip up the Mississippi River with a supply of blank marriage licenses, there being no person north of St. Paul who is authorized by law to tie the nuptial knot. Many couples are represented to be in an awful state of suspense, more properly imagined than described. The Minnesota Pioneer, January 30th, 1850. Traveling into this frontier life for adventure and religious work came the missionaries. But Minnesota needed a special temperament for her new residents. It wasn't just the weather that was a challenge. Daniel Fisher was a young Catholic seminarian from New York sent to serve in Minnesota. In 1852, he wrote a fellow seminarian back home. Dear friend, one soon gets sick of so much monotony, and although the first few miles were pleasant enough, yet I should have rejoiced afterwards to see anything as high above the ground as a dunghill. But such rich soil it is, and so deep. New Yorkers never dream of so much fertility. St. Paul is a large town. When the boat arrived, there were a thousand persons collected on the shore, although it was nearly 10 o'clock at night. The Catholics are very poor here, and what is worse, very irreligious and indifferent. They are half-breeds, Canadians and Irish. The Yankees have all the influence, the wealth and the power, although they are not near as numerous as the others. There are three papers published weekly here. There are six churches, and any number of doctors and lawyers and parsons. But there is no money, as all the wealth is controlled by a fur company who owns nearly all the shops and employ a great number of workmen and never circulate any money. Oh, they loan it at 60%. They pay their men in provisions. But I cannot say so much about the place as I have been in it only a month. What am I doing, do you think? I'm teaching Catholic school. My mission is among the dirty little ragged Canadian and Irish boys. Every day, morning and afternoon, I practice patience with these wild little fellows trying to teach them who God is and then to instruct them in the mysteries of. I left to go among the Indians and I was hoping for strength to undergo the hardships of a savage life or to meet a martyr's death. I felt the difficulty of the sacrifice more than anybody thought, but the greatest trial was the one I never dreamed of, and to take the charge of these impudent and insulting children of unthankful parents was the greatest mortification I ever underwent. But it was a momentary feeling of pride which prompted these thoughts. I told the bishop that I would undertake the school, and having reflected that if this was so great a mortification, it would be more acceptable to God. I went into the little, low, unplastered schoolroom with so much love for my office as if I were Vicar General of New York. Whenever I get time and my head cease to ache, I study theology. The bishop told me the other day that he would ordain me in September, but whether he will ordain me priest or only subdeacon, I do not know. It is well for those who thought of coming here that they did not come. I think they would have been only disappointed in everything. The only thing that can sustain a New Yorker in this wild country is the hope of a speedy release from this life and a good place in the next. Harriet Nichols was also a missionary, but with a very different approach to adventure. She lived in what is now Morrison County in a little town named Belle Prairie. She wrote to her brother. Belle Prairie, June 9, 1852. My dear brother Henry, I suppose you are interested in courtship and marriage, and anything of that nature so closely connected with your far-off sister may not be uninteresting to you. Now... 
When the canoe came down for us a fortnight ago, Mr. Lafferty, a young man who went up there as a missionary last summer, accompanied the boatsman for the purpose of obtaining a wife in Belle Prairie. The missionaries there had advised him to get Miss Smith, as she had been in the territory so long, and they were acquainted with her. She also heard of him before, and to confess the truth, was desirous of obtaining his hand. When he came, he was a little disappointed in her, or rather was better pleased with the rest of us than he expected. We have all four of us been here for some weeks, and he remarked to Mrs. Ayer, the wife of the chief missionary, that she had got a fine lot of girls. Now, don't you think that we were placed in a rather delicate circumstance? I don't like this way of doing up the business. He was so anxious to please the missionaries that he had not independence enough to act for himself. Why, I should judge from his appearance that he was a worthy gentleman and would probably have made any of us a good husband. You would have thought, had you had been here, that we had a curious time, and I assure you we did. There was enough romance acted here to write as good a story as you will find in any novel. In one week from the time Mr. L first arrived here, they were engaged. On the next morning, married. And in an hour afterwards, he left in the canoe with the goods. And she proceeded with the company eight days later. Harriet herself was married in 1853 to William Harrison Fletcher, a farmer. Dear brother, I'm glad you're so well pleased with your new home, as I am with mine. We all form one family and get along nicely. I have quite a little family to take care of. Several pigs and 18 chickens, which have got so that they fly up onto my shoulders almost every time I go out. And then I'm kept quite busy mending husband's stockings and mittens. And I go with him sometimes to draw water from the creek. He says I must tell you to come up and see us. He don't feel like writing to strangers. All my love, Harriet. January 17, 1855. We have recently taken two Indian boys, one 10 and the other four years of age. Their names are George J. and James Bailey, to bring them up until they're 21. It's a week today since we took them, and they've done well so far. The oldest boy seems to like work, and he's very kind to the little one. He takes most of the care of him. Their father wants them to be brought up like white children. The youngest is partly white, has light hair, and is an interesting child. Love to Nancy and the children. Yours with much affection, Harriet S. Fletcher. Wednesday, January 31st. A little stranger arrived here last Thursday about 4 p.m. They all that have seen you say he resembles you. I was taken sick about five in the morning and on the whole had a comfortable time. I was obliged, however, to lie 10 hours afterward before all was over. We sent for Dr. Lewis and he succeeded well in removing the difficulty. I've been gaining rapidly ever since. We call the baby Charles Benjamin. Our sister-in-law, Mrs. Jane Fletcher, is with me. Let us hear from you soon. The little things you sent look sweetly on the baby. Yours, H.S.F. October, 1858. We are all well except Louise. She's now sick with a fever. I think it's the typhoid, the same that Uncle M had a few weeks ago. I think I never saw fever run so high as hers does. Her face is scarlet and her flesh is burning hot. I gave her five ice packs yesterday and washed her about 15 times in cold water before I could inhibit the fever heat in the least. Today she's better. Her fever does not rage as it did yesterday. I bathe her once in half an hour and succeed in subduing the heat to a great extent. 
I think by tomorrow I will conquer it entirely, and in a few days she will be as well as ever. This was the mode of my doctoring my dear husband with the dysentery and fever. We employ no physicians. After he began to get better, I was taken down quite sick with the dysentery, brought upon me by being over him night and day. The day that I was taken sick, one of the physicians of the place, he saw me, said I was very sick, and should probably have a long sickness. He gave me of his own free will and free of charge some powders. The physicians do not have good success at all. Their patients run along seven or eight weeks and then die. So I laid his powders on the shelf and doctored myself. By the blessing of the Lord, I was able to attend the convention in three days with my husband and children. We had a delightful time. With much affection, Harriet. Warning, there is a reaper whose name is Death, and since no one can tell when he will thrust in his sickle and cut us off from life, now is the time to have your picture taken at Whitney's Gallery, where as good a daguerreotype can be procured as any other establishment in the world. The Weekly Minnesotian, January 3rd, 1856. Minnesota was a state for only three years when the Civil War broke out in the spring of 1861. Governor Ramsey happened to be in Washington April 13th as Fort Sumter surrendered. The next morning, he volunteered over 1,000 Minnesota men. Patriotism ran high, and Minnesota men were involved in some of the worst battles including Antietam, called the bloodiest single day of the war, and Gettysburg, where a Minnesota regiment was sacrificed to buy time for the Union forces. In all, about 25,000 Minnesota men fought, and 2,500 died. Isaac Taylor kept a diary of his time in the 1st Minnesota Volunteers Unit, which fought at Gettysburg. June 30th, light showers and sunshine alternate. Mustard for pay in a.m. In p.m. I go out round to farmhouses and get bread, butter, milk and eggs and etc. A good union lady gives me a quart of apple butter. We live on the top shelf today. The boys are re-enthusiastic in their admiration of Maryland generally and at the nice bread and nice girls in particular. General Hancock issues an order complimenting us for our vigorous exertions in marching full 30 miles yesterday and saying that such a march was required by the Major General commanding on account of urgent necessity. July 1. The news that General Meade has superseded General Hooker is confirmed. I shall hope for the best, but I don't like the idea of changing commanders on the eve of battle. Just after passing through Harney Town, a citizen tells us we're in PA. At Tanny Town, we hear there's been fighting at Gettysburg today. At 8.45 p.m., we halt within a few miles of Gettysburg, build a barricade of fence rails. The full moon occasionally appears from behind the clouds. Bivouac for the night. July 4th, 1863. The owner of this diary was killed by a shell about sunset July 2nd, 1863. His face was toward the enemy. I, his brother, buried him 350 paces west of the road which passes north and south by the houses of Jacob Hummelbaugh and John Fisher, colored, and about equal distance from each and a mile south of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. The following is inscribed on a board at his head. I. L. Taylor, 1st Minnesota Volunteers, buried at 10 o'clock a.m., July 3rd, 1863, by his brother, Sergeant P. H. Taylor, Company E, 1st Minnesota Volunteers. We buried him where he fell.
Edward Drew was a farmer near Winona in 1868. He kept a daily diary. Thursday, March 5. All one load of wood. Bundy came and got me to go to Winona and get a load of lumber for him. Friday, 6 March. Haul eight loads of firewood today. Nicholas chops up trees and helps me load. Saturday, March 7. I am compelled to chronicle here the saddest event of my life. Nothing could have happened to me that would have been more so. My wife was taken sick about midnight. About six o'clock her child was born. About nine she died. The poor child is alive and well. Oh, what a day. What is this world to me now? Were it not for my poor, helpless, motherless children, they must be taken care of. Sunday, March 8. Lonely, lonely day, and dreary enough to me. Monday, March 9, following dear wife to her grave today. Funeral appointed at 10 o'clock a.m. Sermon by the Reverend Mr. Dudley. Text, St. John 11, 3. Lord, behold him who thou lovest is sick. Tuesday, March 10. Spring birds are flying over this morning. Froze quite hard in the morning, but soon begins to thaw very much. Haul big load of corn to the yard and Nicholas hauls it. I overhaul the harness and shoulders again the second time. Cut up the meat, get the old meat out of the cellar. Dreary time. Wednesday, March 11. Spring has come. Hear the prayer chickens for the first time. There is lots of good stuff coming up, so don't go away. We'll be right back with more Bring Warm Clothes.